Eli. 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 All right, welcome, welcome. Glad y'all are here. Let's all stand, everybody that's able, and let's sing. He keeps me safe. Here we go. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. And all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, all my life was wrecked by sin and strife, this would fill my heart with pain, Jesus swept across the Chords again, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing and keeps me singing as I go. Feast of the riches of this grace, beneath the sheltering wind. Looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. He fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he Sometimes his past seems rough and steep. I see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing. Singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to. the starry sky, I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I day that'll be. Yes. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forever to the promised land. What a day, a glorious day there will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to No more sickness, no pain, and no more parting over there. And forever I will be who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I'll look upon his face, the one who saved by His grace, He takes me by the hand and leads me through God's promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Let's sing the chorus one more time. What a day that will be when my Jesus I. 
I should see. And I looked upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. Praise the Lord. What a great day that's going to be. Amen. Welcome this morning to our 11 o'clock service. We're glad that you're here this morning. Welcome all those on Facebook who are watching us today. We're glad that you're able to join us uh, as well. Just a couple of announcements before we do our Bible reading this morning. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. As you know, we're reading through this psalm together on Sunday mornings. We'll be in verses 65 through 72 today in Psalm 119. While you're turning there, I just want to mention a couple of things. We had a deacons meeting this morning and to make some decisions on moving forward. I watched our governor's uh, address to the uh, state this week and watched it again actually yesterday. Uh, and of course, the sheltering in place order is still in order. Uh, they're asking you to wear a mask, not mandating it, but asking you to wear a mask in public places. We do have some masks in the front. If anybody would choose to wear one here at the church, you're welcome to do so. If you don't have one, we have some available to you. You don't have to do that, but if you'd like to, you can. Um, also, uh, no gathering and gatherings of 50 or more is still in place, and they're not giving any projected timeline now mm -hmm. when that will stop. Because of those things, we decided this morning we're going to continue doing services the way we are. We're going to do two services Sunday morning, 9 and 11, and then we'll do Wednesday night Bible study as I'm doing now at 7 o'clock. That's the only things we're going to be doing uh, up until we can finally get out of this and uh, start coming back and doing uh, regular services like we normally do. Also, uh, we're going to begin having our conferences, our business meetings, starting in August. August the 23rd, I believe that's the date. That's on the fourth Sunday in August. Uh, we'll have our deacons meeting that morning. Then we'll have conference at 1030. So if you coming at 11 service want to be at conference, you need to be here at 1030 on that day. And we'll have our conference that way. The people at 9 service can be there too. So we'll have our conference at August 23rd at 1030 uh, that morning. Uh, we do have financial statements here. If you'd like a, uh, the, sh the financial statement for the church, we actually have one for from March through July uh, because we haven't had a business meeting since uh, February. And so March through July meeting notes are up here. If you'd like to get one of those, you can do that after service there in this uh, manila folder on the table here. I uh, just want to mention again, our offering uh, basket is on the table back there. So you use that, put your offering in as you come in or go out. And we decided this morning uh, in our deacons meeting as well that we're going to continue to do that permanently. Actually, I'm going to probably get a box that we'll put out front so we'll no longer pass the plates around anymore even when we come back to everything. we just put a box out there and that's how you do your offerings and tithes and things like that uh, to the church from now on. Okay? All right. Um, let's look at our Bible together this morning and read Psalm 119, verse 65 through 72 as we prepare our hearts to receive from the word of the Lord. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Let's pray together. Father, how grateful we are this morning to be together again in this place to worship you and praise your name, to sing these hymns together, Lord, and just to put our mind and our heart on you, to set our focus on you today and our gaze upon you, Jesus, and to open the scriptures together to read the word of God and study the word of God together, Father. Thank you for blessing us with this opportunity. I thank you for everyone who is here this morning with me in this place today, for them coming out together today to worship you and to hear from your word. And I thank you for everyone who's watching, uh, whether it be live on Facebook, watch later on Facebook or YouTube. Lord, I pray for everyone who is listening to this today, God, that you speak to each one's heart and each one's life, that your will would be done in all of our lives, Lord, and we would submit ourselves unto you and allow you to lead us and guide us in this world. Help us, O oh Lord, to follow you and be light and salt in this earth and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us. We pray that you be with all those on our prayer list this morning, those who are sick and hurting. We ask you to touch and strengthen their bodies, their minds, and their spirits, Father. We 
Pray, God, that you would be with those who are grieving. Bless them, Lord, with peace and comfort that only you can give, Father. We pray, God, that you be with this nation. Help those who are working in the medical fields today against this virus. We ask that you would bless them with encouragement and peace of mind and heart and strengthen their bodies. God, to do what they do, Father, each and every day. We pray, God, that you would bless our nation with healing. We pray for spiritual awakening in our land, that people would turn to you, Lord, and would begin to be saved, Father, and follow you, Father, we pray. And God, we pray that you would uh, bless this ministry. Use us, Lord, in our community, that we would be a preservative for you in this community, Father, that we would glorify your name in all that we do, and God, we would be obedient to the Great Commission. Lord, thank you for that. God, we pray you bless the rest of the service, bless, Lord, in the worship, and bless in the preaching of the Word of God. Have your way this morning, we pray, and we love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The song this morning is the Revelation song. I just wanted to read you some of the scripture that the song is based on this morning. Revelation 3, 4. Or three, no, four, three. There we go. And uh, through five. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Amen. Can you imagine? We, you can't imagine. No. So, so uh, we'll we'll all see it one day. Experience that in person. Amen. We do. All right, Revelation song. <clears throat> Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to sit on heaven's mercy seat. Where is the Lamb who was slain? It's all heaven's mercy seat. And holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you clothed in rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and Glory and power be to you, the only wise King. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, I will. Adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. 
And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is With all creation I praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Great song, amen? amen. Revelation song. That's the, the book we're in, Revelation. Let's go to the Bible and open up the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. Revelation chapter 20, as we begin looking each verse at the millennial reign of Christ. The millennial reign of Christ, the 1,000 year reign of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The context of this, of course, is verses 1 through 10. Today we'll get verse 1, 2, and 3, and the first point of this context of Scripture on the millennial reign of Christ. If you have your Bibles open, you're able to. Please stand with me in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and errant, and infallible Word. May we hear from the Word of the Lord. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. For such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for the public reading of the scriptures again this morning. We thank you for this passage, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the promise of your millennial reign, your thousand year reign that you will come to this world, and you will reign literally and physically from Jerusalem over this planet. And your church will rule and reign with you during that time. Thank you for this promise of Satan being bound in chains and being sealed up in the bottomless pit, not to be able to deceive the nations any longer during that time. Lord, we pray as we look at this passage this morning that you give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in the Scriptures. I ask again, as I asked this morning at the 9 o'clock service, that you empty me of myself and fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to preach, Lord, in the power and demonstration of your Spirit. Give my voice strength today, I pray, and help me, Lord, to my mind be clear able to articulate well this message that you've given me that will be clear and understandable. I pray for the hearers, those who are here and those who are watching, that God, you would help them to be attentive to your word with an understanding and a desire to walk in obedience to you. And Lord, as always, I pray for the sinner's soul, that this morning you would break their hearts over their sins with godly sorrow, that would lead them to repentance and faith in you today. Feed and nourish your people and equip them to go out and do the work of the ministry. We love you this morning and give you praise and glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, last week as we began this section, we didn't really get into the verses. We talked about the three main viewpoints of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. 
I am a premillennialist, as you saw last week, thus I teach the scriptures from this viewpoint. Matter of fact, the very first words in this verse, then I saw in this chapter, indicate a chronological progression. This is consistent with a premillennial view of the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. After the seven-year tribulation, which is described in Revelation chapter 6 through 18, Christ would then come back, which is described in Revelation 19, 11 through 21. He will set up his earthly kingdom, which is here in chapter 20, verse 1 through 10. So the millennial kingdom naturally comes after the second coming of Jesus Christ and before the new heavens and the new earth are created, which we see in chapter 21, verse 1. Last week, I quoted from Anthony Hokima, who is a millennialist, from a book he wrote called The Meaning of the Millennium, and he says this. Uh, again, I want to quote from his book. Let us assume, for example, that the book of Revelation is to be interpreted in an exclusively futuristic sense, and I do believe that it should be interpreted in a futuristic sense. He goes on and says, Let us further assume that what is presented in Revelation 20 must necessarily follow in chronological order what was described in chapter 19. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? We are then virtually compelled to believe that the thousand-year reign depicted in chapter 20, verse 4, must come after the return of Christ described in chapter 19, verse 11, end quote. Well, if I could speak to Mr. Anthony Hokima, I would say this is exactly what is occur, will occur. It's a natural occurrence in chronological order, and I'm not assuming anything. I believe it. Amen? Uh, I believe it's going to happen just as we're looking at it in chronological order that Jesus Christ will return. And once, when he returns, he will set his kingdom up on this earth, literally and physically be here, reigning from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And the church will rule and reign with him during that time. I believe it, I believe it due to many prophecies throughout the Bible that we looked at several of them last week. If you remember that, if you're here with me about the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, The passage clearly teaches that Christ's return precedes the millennial kingdom, a scenario incompatible with postmillennialism and amillennialism, but exactly what premillennialism teaches. End quote. The postmillennialist and the amillennialist must deny that chapter 20 follows chapter 19 chronologically. This, denies, this denial ignores the chronological significance of the Greek phrase. Keia Iado. Keia Iado is the Greek for then I saw in verse 1. This denial also ignores the continuity of the text. If you deny that chapter 20 chronologically comes after chapter 20, uh, chapter 19. Jesus first deals with the Antichrist and the false prophet in chapter 19 by casting them into the lake of fire alive. And then he deals with the armies of the earth at the battle of Armageddon destroying them. So why would you ignore the very next thing that Jesus deals with, which is their evil master, the devil himself, Satan. But they ignore these obvious facts only to support their viewpoint and to eliminate pre millennialism So let's get right into the text now together this morning in verses 1, 2, and 3. And let's study the first point about the millennial reign of Christ. And the very first point is Satan's removal. I mean, just that makes you want to shout. Think about those words. Satan's removal. Amen. Verse 1 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key, or the key, to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. So the first thing we noticed here is an angel descending from heaven. And we know that it is the Father, God the Father, is dispatching this angel to the earth. Jesus is already on the earth at this time. He's not in heaven. He's already returned. He's in Jerusalem. God dispatches this angel, and he comes with a key and a chain uh, the key is to the bottom of his pit. He comes with this great chain to bind the devil. Now, who is this angel? Well, I believe this might be Michael, the archangel. Now, it doesn't tell us here his name, of course. But I'm going to tell you why I believe it might be Michael, the archangel. And I'm going to share the scriptures with you to show you why I think it might be him uh, disputing and fighting with the devil. As we see throughout scripture, and I'm going to show you different places, that we can see Michael, and he's named Michael, disputing with demonic spirits, very strong demonic spirits, and Satan himself uh, when it comes to dealing with the nation of Israel. Listen to this, first of all, in the Old Testament. In Daniel chapter number 10, I'm going to read verses 12, 13, and 14, and then skip down to verse 20 and 21. Let me kind of tell you what's going on in Daniel 10 before I read those verses. In Daniel 10, Daniel, he's living under the Persian rule. The Persian Empire had conquered Babylon, 
and now the Persians are ruling, and Daniel is serving the Persian king, and he's, he's praying about something. He's saying, he had this vision, and he's praying about this, trying to get answers from the Lord, and he's praying and fasting for 21 days, three weeks. He goes praying and fasting every day, not getting an answer, and then finally the angel comes to him, and this is what the angel says to him in verse 12. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So the angel says, Daniel, from the very first day you began to pray and fast, God sent me from heaven to come and see you. And it didn't take the angel three weeks to travel from heaven to earth. No, angels can travel from heaven to earth just like that. Amen? Uh, they, they're not restricted by time and space as we are. It doesn't take long at all. What restricted him was demonic forces. And let me, he says this in verse 13. He says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Now when he says the prince of the king of Persia hindered him or withstood him, is he talking about a human man, a prince? No. No human being can withstand an angel, right? So this is a demonic spirit that is over the prince of Persia, over the government of Persia. And he's withstanding the angel coming to Daniel. So this tells us that demonic spirits interfere with the activity of the church and God or God's people and, and our prayer life. When we're praying, we're literally in spiritual warfare. Amen? Uh, when we're walking with Christ, we're in spiritual warfare. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 6, Paul tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but our battle is against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen? And so we can see here in Daniel that this is spiritual wickedness in high places. Matter of fact, him being called the prince of the kings of Persia, it means he's a very high-ranked and powerful demonic spirit that Satan puts over the government of Persia. This also tells us that over the wicked governments of the world are demonic spirits. Even today, that had not changed a bit. Demonic spirits are ruling over governments of the world. And I can tell you, we can today and we can see things going on in our land and we can see so much evil and bitterness and hatred. We can see how demonic activity is in control of things in our governments, not just locally and, and statewide, but nationally as well. Amen. And it's no wonder that God would allow these things to happen in this country with so many babies being aborted in wombs every day and it being accepted like it's okay. And with sexual immorality being accepted like it's okay. And homosexuality and lesbianism being accepted like it's okay. And all this sin being accepted. No wonder God's allowing all these things to take place. And it's, I believe we're in the judgment of God in this country, in this world. Amen? Amen, church. I believe we all all these things because of how people turn from the word of God and turn from God and they don't want to hear from God. They don't want to know what God has to say in this world. Of course, we know it's going to be that way in the world. Jesus said it would be. What we can see here in Daniel 10, as I get back to that, he goes on, the angel says to Daniel, now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So he tells him he was withstood by this demonic spirit, and listen, Michael had to be dispatched from God to come and fight against this spirit so that this angel could get through to Daniel. So this shows us that Michael is a high-ranking angel himself. He's a cherub. I believe he's a cherubim. And he's a, he's a very powerful angel with a lot of authority that God has given him to be able to come and attack this demonic spirit so that the other angel can break through to Daniel. Now in verse 20 in Daniel 10, then he said, the angel speaking to Daniel, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. So he, he gives him the reason why he come, the verses I didn't read. And now he says, i got to go back to this same fight I had with this demonic spirit over the government of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. Hear what he says? He says, now it's getting time for the Persian Empire to fight. So the demonic spirit who will be over the Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, uh, to, for that rule, it's getting time for them to take their position. He says, but I tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these, against these demonic spirits, except Michael, your prince. Michael, the archangel, is mentioned again. He's named twice here in Daniel chapter number 2, showing his activity against the very powerful demonic spirits and Satan's work to try to destroy God's creation. From this passage, though, we can see the strength and power and authority that Michael the archangel has. 
You know, Satan, when God created Satan, he was Lucifer. His name was Lucifer before it came Satan, which Lucifer means light bearer. That's what that name means. He was probably the highest created being God created. Uh, he had great power. God bestowed upon him. He was still a created being. He wasn't God, of course, but he was a highly uh, created being. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14 and 15, God speaking about Lucifer. He says, you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And of course, that iniquity was pride that entered his heart because he wanted to be like God and he wanted to be worthy of God and he wanted to create his And that's what he's still trying to do today and which will come into fruition here in the book of Revelation with the Antichrist and the false prophet as he sets up his earthly kingdom uh, in that way. This is why Michael would not personally rebuke Satan, but, but ask the Lord to do it. In other words, Satan had more authority and power than Michael when they were angels together. Then Satan failed, even though Michael still has the same authority. Satan still was also a very powerful being. And the book of Jude in the New Testament gives us a window into that struggle between Satan and Michael. And this happened over the body of Moses, so it happened in the Old Testament. But Jude writes about it in Jude chapter 1, verse 9. He writes, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So Michael didn't say, I rebuke you. He said, The Lord rebuke you. So we can see that in those passages in Daniel and then in Jude, speaking of what happened in the Old Testament time around Moses' body, that we can see Michael disputing with Satan, Michael battling with Satan. God will give Michael this authority again to overcome the devil. Uh, it's going to happen in the heavens first, in a battle in the war in the heavens. And then it's going to happen here as we see in chapter 20 when he binds him in chains. So go back with me again to chapter 12 in Revelation, verse 7. I believe this happens at the rapture of the church when this takes place. as they will, that Satan and his demonic spirits will try to interfere with the rapture, with the saints of God being resurrected and rapture called up to be with the Lord in the air. And so God will send Michael, the archangel, with his angels to come and fight against Satan and the demons and cast him out of the heavens. So let me read this to you again in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, beginning there. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. You see that? No longer after this battle will Satan be able to go into the heavens anymore. Right now, Satan can go wherever he wants to. He can even go to, into the third heaven. We see that in the book of Job. He does that. Matter of fact, he's the accuser of the brethren. He goes before God and he accuses us day and night. He makes accusation against the church, the body of Christ. Yet we have Christ Jesus, our Lord, our high priest, our advocate, who stands for us at the right hand of the Father and speaks on our behalf. Aren't you glad that day, church? Amen. So Satan is there. He goes wherever he wants to. He roams around. He's, he's out. He's not in the bottomless pit right now. As the amillennialists believe, we, they think we are in the millennial reign of Christ now, today. No way. Look at the world, how it is. There's no way we can be in the millennial reign right now. He says, but they did not prevail, nor was found a place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon, I want you to notice this. I'm going to come back to this a little later. Because all the titles for the devil are given here that are given in chapter 20. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the, to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. There he tells us right there. He's the accuser of the church. The accuser of the body, he makes accusations against us, but we have Christ, the, the, our intercessor with the Father, our advocate with the Father, who stands for his bride before the devil. Whoever this angel is in chapter, let's go back to chapter 20. I believe it being Michael, it doesn't name him here, but I believe it being Michael because of how we see Michael working against the devil in Scripture. God's going to give him great power to come and see Satan bind him in a chain, cast him into the abyss, and seal it up for the millennial reign of Christ. Now, as we look at verse 1, we see this great angel coming down from heaven. He has a key to the bottomless pit. We've already seen this key one time in our study of Revelation, in Revelation chapter number 9. If you read, read chapter 9, you see that's where this, he's given the, this angel's given the key to the bottomless pit. He opens the bottomless pit, and that's when all the demons come out. 
of the bottomless pit. This is during the tribulation period. And actually, it's during the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period when this takes place. And those demons will be released upon the world, and they will go out and torment men and women, boys and girls, who, uh, who have the mark of the beast. They will torment them for six months, not be able to kill them until after that six months period. And then people will be able uh, to die. But these demons will be released. So these demons are held in this prison, this abyss, this bottomless pit, in chains until that time they will be released. For a greater understanding of chapter 9, uh, you can get a copy of those sermons from me if you like to listen to those. And so we see the word bottomless pit in verse 1. This is translated from the Greek word abusos. Abusos means deathless. It means uh, specifically an abyss or a deep pit. It appears in the book of Revelation, listen to this, seven times. Abusos, seven times in the book of Revelation. Seven is the number for God, and the God's number is the number for perfection, right? It also refers to the, uh, it always refers to the temporary place of incarceration for certain demons. In other words, this pit, it has one purpose and one person only. For God putting and incarcerating these demonic spirits to hold them in this place for the day of judgment. Now, these angels that are there today are the ones in Genesis chapter 6 that you see cohabitating with earthly women where the giants came from, the, the, the Nephilim, if you will, came from. And God, because of that, sent the flood, and he took those demonic spirits and chained them and put them in this bottomless pit. This is the same place that Satan will be cast into. Now, this is not their final place of judgment. No, the lake of fire is. That's, the lake of fire is their final place. Matter of fact, Jesus says in Matthew 24, I mean 25, 41, that he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So the lake of fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. This is the place we saw in chapter 19 where the Antichrist and the false prophet were cast alive into. And we see here in chapter 20 and verse 10 where Satan is cast into the lake of fire along with all the demonic spirits as well. Now, this abyss, this abusos, this deep pit where these demons are kept, reserved in chains, where Satan will be put, this is a place that demons fear. Did you know that? Demons don't want to be cast into this place. How do we know? Well, in Luke chapter 8, we find a story where Jesus sees the man who's possessed with a legion of demons. Let me read some verses in that, beginning at verse 29 in Luke 8. For he, Christ, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. He broke the bonds and was driven by demons into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons entered him. And they begged him, they referring to the demons, begged him, referring to Christ, that he would not command them to go out into the abyss, the abusos. They didn't want to go to that bottomless pit. Because they didn't want to be held in chains and reserved to the day of judgment. They want to be able to go out free and roam and possess other beings. Each demon in this place has been chained. Everyone that's in this place has been chained. Thus it's natural for Satan to be chained as well when he's cast into it. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. The angels, and he's referring to those angels who are in this pit now. Jude is. The angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So these chains that hold these demons and this chain that Michael, I believe Michael here, has to bind Satan, this is just no ordinary chain. This is, this is a great powerful chain to be able to bind the greatest creature ever created who is Satan. <clears throat> To be able to bind him and hold him for a thousand years? Think about that. This is why the adjective megos in the Greek is used to describe this chain. Which the megos means mega. Or exceedingly strong is a definition for this Greek word megos. Mega, exceedingly strong. It's an unbreakable chain even by the strongest creature God created. And so in verse 1 we see the angel, I believe Michael, coming down from heaven, has the key to the bottomless pit and a chain in his hand. Verse 2. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, the word laid hold is translated from the Greek term krateo. It means to use strength, 
to see some attain them. It comes from the word, the root word, kraktos, which means great vigor or great strength to have dominion and power over someone. And so we can see that God's given Michael great vigor and great strength and great power to lay hold of Satan himself and bind him in these chains to cast him into the bottom pit. I'm going to say Satan is not going to willingly surrender here. Okay? I mean, this is not like Christ when they carried him to the cross and he willingly laid down his life for us. Satan's going to fight against this. Amen? He don't want to do this. He's going to fight against this. And so Michael's going to have this great, this kratos, this great vigor and great strength and dominion to overpower the devil and bind him up in these chains in this to seal him up. We also notice in verse 2 these four titles given to Satan. And remember I said when I was reading chapter 12, I said pay attention because we read these same four titles in chapter 12 of Satan. So let's look individually each one uh, as we look at this verse. The first one we see is dragon. He's called a dragon. He laid hold of the dragon. That word in the Greek is dracon. Dracon, it comes from the form of Dercomai. It means a fabulous kind of serpent, uh, supposed to be fascinated, or dragon. Not just regular snake or a lizard. This is something that's fascinating to behold. The title is given to Satan, listen to this, 12 times in the book of Revelation. Dracon is given to Satan 12 times in the book of Revelation. I just like the number 7 as a number of perfection. The number 12 is also number of perfection or completion I should say it's the number of governmental completion hence the 12 tribes of Israel make up the government of Israel the 12 apostles make up the government of the church which makes up the 12 foundations of the new city Jerusalem which has 12 gates to enter in which is the capital city of God's kingdom of the new heavens and the new earth and so 12 is a number for governmental perfection. So showing him as the dragon or dracon 12 times shows that Satan's attempt to raise up his kingdom and his government above God's government. This goes in line with what he wanted to do from the very beginning in his rebellion against God. Isaiah writes it in Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14. God speaking. God says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And that's not the stars we see in the night sky. That's angels he's talking about. He says, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You know what the devil saying? He says, I'm going to exalt myself above all the other creatures that God's created. I'm going to even exalt myself as high as God is, and I'm going to be a God myself. I'm going to elevate my kingdom, is what he's talking about. And so we can see that Dragon is used 12 times showing Satan's attempt to elevate his kingdom in this world. You know, he tried this the first time when they built the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. That was the first attempt by the devil to set up his rule on this planet political and religious system of man. And it's going to come to fruition again in the tribulation when the Antichrist and the false prophet are put in place because the Antichrist will rule over the political system and the, and the governments and then the false prophet rule over the religious system of the world. This is Satan's attempt to do what he's trying to do is set up his kingdom in this world. But he's going to fail. Amen? He's going to be put into a pit. And Christ is coming to set up his kingdom Amen. on this earth. Amen? The word dragon also emphasizes a bestial nature, a ferociousness, an oppressive cruelty. There's no niceness in Satan. Did you know that? There's no kindness in him whatsoever. There is no grace and mercy in him at all. He is the opposite of God. Amen? None. I mean, you know, Disney and Hollywood, they like to paint... Say, uh, satanic stuff and witchcraft and all that to look like it's fun and kids can have fun being involved in all that stuff. But I'm telling you, there's no niceness and funness in satanic stuff. Amen, church? There's none at all. Matter of fact, that's why the Bible clearly tells us in the Old and New Testament that we're not to have anything to do with it as Christians at all, with evil and darkness. We're, we're supposed to be light of the world. So we see dragon, dracon. The next thing we see in verse 2 
He's also called the serpent of old. The serpent of old. Serpent is translated from the Greek word office. It's through the idea of a sharpness of vision, being able to see very clearly, which shows us Satan sees us very clearly. He knows how to come at us. He knows how to bring temptation to us. Amen? So he has a sharp vision. It, it also transfers office a snake. Figuratively, as one that is sly and cunning, an artful, malicious person. An artful, malicious person. Well, this describes the devil very good, doesn't it? And he's a he's nowhere serpent, artful, malicious snake is what Satan is. He's of old. Old is translated from the Greek word archaeus. It means original or prime evil. The original malicious creature. He's the first one to sin. The first one to do that. This title, Serpent of Old, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden with Satan's temptation of Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the what? Serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So we see the first time Satan is shown in Scripture, he's shown as the serpent of old. The first one to come as a malicious person and cunning, crafty person to deceive the woman. Now think about this, church. And you that watching me, listen to this. Eve walked with God every day. Hurry now. They walked with God every day. They did, Eve didn't know the world like we know it at the time before she fell. She didn't know heartache. She didn't know trouble. She didn't know pain. She didn't know suffering. She didn't know any of those things. It was perfect, always perfect. Everything was until this day here in Genesis 3. And Satan could tempt her. Couldn't he tempt us? And we live in a fallen world, don't we? Amen? We're after the fall. It's easier to tempt us than it was to tempt her. This is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians about this. Listen to what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, using this same word for serpent. But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He says, listen, he is crafty. The devil's crafty, and he knows how to tempt us. He's the serpent of old. Thirdly, we see the third title is he's called the devil. He's called the devil. In the Greek, this is translated from the Greek word diabolos, which means a traducer, a false accuser, a slanderer, one who slanders, diabolos. It also means malicious gossip. This is an appropriate title for the accuser of the church, isn't it? Remember Revelation 12, verse 10, accuser of the brethren? He, he makes accusation against us uh, day and night before the Lord. And so he's a malicious gossip. He's a diabolos. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something. This word, diabolos, which describes the devil as a malicious gossip and a slanderer, did you know Paul used this word three times, two times referring to women? And then one time referring to male and females in the last days. I'm going to read you these places. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. Paul used this word talking about deacons' wives, women who are married to deacons. Likewise, their wives. They're referring to deacons. This is in the scripture where it gives the, uh, the qualifications for deacons. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers. That word is diabolos. So you could translate it, not devils. Deacon's wives should not be devils. Amen. <laughs> they should not be malicious gossipers. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 3, he's given uh, standards for older men and older women in the church, how they should do. And he says, The older women, likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not devils, not malicious gossipers. Listen, when we, if you gossip about somebody, that's sin. That you're acting in the devil state. Did you know that? Malicious gossip and slandering someone's character, that's diabolos. That's what the devil does. We need to repent if we're doing that and get right with the Lord. Amen? So twice he mentions that there concerning women. Now, listen, women. Men can do the same thing too. Amen? We can do the same thing. And then it, and he covers that, both sexes here in chapter, 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. This is the characteristics of how people will be in the last days. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. Diabolos, devils, 
without self-control, brutal despisers of good. Well, that's the way people are now. Well, you turn on the news and you see a bunch of slanderers. Can I get an amen? Amen. You get, all you see is a bunch of devils. They call journalists. They used to be called. They used to be called journalists. Now they're a bunch of devils, slandering people's characters just because they don't agree with somebody. Amen. I tell you, it's an awful time we live in today. Devils. The fourth thing we see in this verse describing Satan is the word Satan, the name Satan. In the, it's, it's really Aramaic, Aramaic, I'm sorry, Aramaic in its origin. The word is Satanus. Satanus. It means accuser. It means the devil. This word along with its Hebrew word, root word Satan is used 53 times in all of Scripture. And both words mean adversary. Satan is our adversary. He's opposed to God. He's opposed to Christ. He's opposed to the church. He is our adversary. He will never be your friend. Amen? He's our adversary. And he's going to be bound here in verse 2 for a thousand years. That is a literal thousand years. He will be bound by Jesus Christ is reigning on this earth. Now let's look at verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. Shut him up set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So Satan's going to be thrown into this abyss, this bottomless pit. And he's going to, the angel's going to close this pit. And he's going to put a seal, set a seal on this pit for a thousand years. Now set a seal is translated from the Greek term spradzidzo. And it means to stamp with the signet. Like in the olden times whenever a leader or ruler would write a letter or send a letter or law out to someone. They would put wax on it and put a, a signet and stamp that wax, seal that wax, seal the letter. And the only one that had the authority to break that seal was the one who put the seal on it or the one it was addressed to. For instance, in the Old Testament, when Daniel was cast into the lion's den, y'all remember that story, right? And the king of Persia sealed that, to, that, I mean, that den up. So the only one had the authority to open that or loose that seal that Dean was the king of Persia himself, which he did the next morning. And you know that story. And so here we see that Michael, I believe it's Michael, sets the seal on here, and he is getting his authority from God the Father. And so there's no one able to break this seal on this pit but God the Father. Is there anyone more powerful than God the Father? No. So there's no one going to be able to let Satan out. Amen. <laughs> Well, glory. No prison break. Hallelujah. Amen. No one's been able to let him out during this thousand years. This word set a seal, or the Greek word phragizo, also means for security or per preservation. For security. But listen to this. I love this. It implies to keep a secret. To keep a secret. It's phragizo, to keep a secret. How does this, if it implies to keep a secret, how does, what does that have to do with devil being in the bottomless pit? Well, think about this. After Christ comes back and the devil is put in this pit and Christ is reigning, there's going to be people born during that thousand-year reign of Christ, right? And they're going to grow up not knowing the devil, not knowing Satan, not knowing the demonic spirits, not knowing the things of the devil and temptation and stuff like that. So it's going to be a secret to them. They're not going to know these things until he is released at the end of of the thousand years. Imagine, church, how wonderful it will be to live during a time when Satan is not able to roam around the world. Imagine how wonderful that's going to be. Now, last week we looked at those different viewpoints. I mentioned a few earlier, too. I mentioned them again a few minutes earlier. But the amillennialists and some postmillennialists believe we're living in the millennial now. And I, I we shared last week how that couldn't be because we looked at scriptures last week to show you how the millennial state's going to be, and it's not happening like that now, right? For example, the wolf and the lion act friends, like the Bible says they're going to be during the millennial reign, or, and the, the lion and the ox not eating together. Uh, they might, the, ox, the lion would eat the ox, but right, right now, but they're going to eat together during the millennial reign of Christ. So things aren't the same. Satan is not in the bottomless pit today, y'all. He's still roaming the earth. And we can see the evidence of that just by looking at what's going on in the world, but also by the testimony of Scripture. By the testimony of Scripture. Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came among them, and the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth. And from 
walk it back and forth in it. He's not sealed up. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. The prophet Zechariah writing about Joshua who is the high priest and how Satan is coming to make accusation against Joshua. Listen to this. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? So we can see a window there of how Satan goes before God and makes accusation against God's servants. He's doing that today against us. But thank God we got Christ there to rebuke him for us. Amen. In Luke chapter 4, we see Jesus has been baptized, filled with the Spirit of God, and he's driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. He's tempted for 40 days, 40 nights. After he doesn't eat anything or drink anything, he's hungry. Satan comes to him personally and physically to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 6, as I said earlier, Paul writes to us and tells us that our wrestle is not against flesh and blood. It's against uh, principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan's not bound in a bottomless pit right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15, Paul writes to the church. He's warning about false teachers, false apostles, that they are operating in the same spirit of the devil. Listen to this. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness who end will be according to their works. So he says these false teachers are at work in the body of Christ and they're operating in the spirit of the devil. So Satan's not bound in a pit right now. He's still out at work. James chapter 4 verse 7 James says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If the devil was in a pit, we wouldn't need to resist him. And the last one I saved to read about this is very obvious that the devil's not in a pit today. 1 Peter 5 8. Listen to this. Peter writes to the church Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> Peter said, That joker ain't tied up nowhere. He's out walking around looking for who he can destroy. Amen. So we as a church need to be sober minded and we need to be vigilant on guard against the attacks of the enemy. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, the testimony of Scripture is that Satan is anything but bound in this present age, but will be during the coming earthly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only then that he will be incarcerated so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer. His activity in the world will not be merely restricted or restrained, but totally curtailed. He will not be permitted to influence the world in any way. Wow. Imagine that. Satan will be removed so that he cannot deceive the nations no more. It says here in this passage, doesn't it? Verse 3. That's what he's doing today. That tells us, when we look at that, it says he won't be able to deceive the nations no more. That tells us he's deceiving the nations now. Amen? And that's what he's doing. There's so much deception in this world by the devil. And so many people are following right along with him. I mean, most people don't even realize it. But they are. They are. That's why it's so important, church. We are the only light in this world. I'm talking about the light of Christ. We carry the word of God with us and the light of Christ in us. And that's why Jesus called us to be light in the world and salt in the earth. We're the only light that people can see Christ in is through the body of Christ. And through the preaching and teaching of his scriptures. That's why it's important that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. We live that life before them so they may see the hope in Christ and maybe be saved and escape the devil's torment. It tells us at the bottom of this verse, though, but after these things he must be released for a little while. Now we're going to look at that in detail when we get to verses 7 through 10. Okay, we get to verses 7 through 10, we'll study his release and what's going to take place after he's released for a little while. And why? Why would God put him in a prison, a bottomless pit, for a thousand years and then let him out again? Why would God do that? Think about that. I'm not going to answer that question today. We're going to wait until we get to that verse to look at that. So as we come to the close of this this morning, think about how wonderful it's going to be, church, the day when Satan is removed. Hallelujah. I mean removed and the demons from the world for that thousand-year reign of Christ. 
How are you going to respond today? Let me ask you, how are you going to respond today knowing that Christ is going to return one day and sin will not be tolerated in his presence? Sin will not be tolerated in his presence. If you're living in sin, I implore you to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone as your Savior. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you, knowing the truth of the Scriptures, that we are keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Keep our focus, our gaze on Christ. Put our affection on things above where Christ is, not on things on this world. Don't let things in this world take your gaze off Jesus, take your attraction off Jesus, take your attention away from Jesus. You keep your eyes on the Lord, knowing that these truths are coming to pass. God's word will be fulfilled. Jesus is coming. Amen? Coming back. Praise the Lord. Well, thank y'all for being with me this morning. I love y'all with all my heart. It's good to see y'all today. Uh, gr grateful that you're here. If I don't ever get to see you again on this side of life, I want to see you in heaven around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen?